Amen. As we begin our service today, we begin by lighting the candle together. So let's do that now. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would fill our homes with joy, love, peace, hope, overflowing today. And as we look ahead at our service, in the previous weeks in our Lenten season, we've been beginning with a video of a song. Um, my candle's needing a little help today. Um, we begin with a song that Ed Wilmington wrote, and each week we layer on another uh, melody line. And today, and also if you've been watching, the sun has been setting um, and the day has been coursing on um, every week and night is coming. And today um, it, the theme is sunset and we'll layer on another um, melody line to the video that we have prepared for you. So during this Lenten season, um, I really do hope as night comes, your homes are filled with greater love, joy, peace, overflowing. It may feel like it's a contrast to the night um, but it is just another evidence of God's presence with us during this Lenten season. So let's pray through this video now. Good morning. Our reading today comes from the book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, chapter 18, verse 1 to 11. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pandas, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went uh, to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they worked together. By trade, then every Sabbath, he would anchor in the synagogue and would try to convince Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with proclaiming the word, testifying to the Jews that the Messiah was Jesus. When they opposed and reviled him, in protest he shook the dust from his clothes and said to them, your blood be on your own heads, I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left the synagogue and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the official of the synagogue, became a believer in the Lord, together with all his household. And many of the Corinthians who had Paul became believers and were baptized. One night the Lord said to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to harm you. For there are many in this city who are my people. 
he stayed there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. Thanks be to God. Friends, I'm really honored to take a few minutes to reflect on this text with you this morning. The interesting thing about the book of Acts, as with most of scripture, is that it never takes the easy route. It doesn't present to us a kind of simplistic one or two dimensional gospel or one or two dimensional history of the people of God. It's always complicated, always complicated. And this is absolutely one of those texts. Let's set it in context. Let's remember that just before this, as the book of Acts shows us in chapter 17, Paul has this, in a certain way, high water mark of public evangelism in the city of Athens. And he portrays this extraordinarily encompassing gospel that is for all of history, for all people in all places. And it's offered with the most um, magnanimous and sort of capacious intellectual vision. And then he proclaims to them the one true and living God that, that they know, as he says there, as the unknown God. It's a very, very interesting and profound text. So then we move from that to a time when various people are converted, as it says at the end of chapter 17, and suddenly we arrive now in Corinth. And in this particular moment, some very, very significant things have happened for Israel, namely, especially that the Jews have been expelled from Roman territory by the emperor. That act is itself just another long piece of the history of uh, God's people, Israel, being excluded. It's a story that has appeared many, many times in the Hebrew scriptures and certainly uh, appears now again here. So as Paul arrives in Corinth, he's arriving amidst a sea of Jews, dislocated yet again, now in a complicated uh, Gentile city, which is now also being filled up with a variety of Jewish people who are coming from Roman territory. And it's in that context that Paul begins to set up his ministry in Corinth. It's clearly a ministry and a relationship that is profound. We have at least two of Paul's letters to Corinth, and many think there may have been other letters written. So clearly it was a body of people that he cared about deeply. And it's noteworthy that the text says that he spent 18 months in this great city. Now, what unfolds is he begins by finding some Jews who are tent makers like he was, and they begin to work side by side. Interestingly, through all of this comes a very strong sense that Paul is continuing to engage in this ministry week by week, the text says, Sabbath by Sabbath, of going to the synagogue to argue, to persuade them to believe that Jesus is the Christ. It's a, an amazingly uh, important text in, in Paul's ministry because it's that strategy in his missiological approach, which just appears again and again up to this particular point. Now, it's a tough ministry. It's complicated. It's complicated because Paul is both a Roman citizen and in some ways, therefore, separated from the experience of Jews being exiled from Rome. And at the same time, he's a Jew. And furthermore, he's exiled a double time because he's also not only a Roman citizen and not quite like most Jews, but also a Christian, now identifying with the life and ministry of Jesus as the fulfillment of what God had given to Israel and was now bringing to its culmination in Jesus Christ. But that, of course, is not responded to well. The, the brief summary of the text gives a strong sense of the kind of argumentation that went back and forth. I know many Jewish friends of mine would say this is a classic synagogue scene, a classic scene where where it wasn't about inspiration, it was about argumentation. It was about intellectually engaging in the text, trying to rigorously understand what is that the, the tradition teaches and how could or couldn't it make space for the opportunity for ministry that now comes along through Paul's proclamation that Jesus is the Christ. Clearly some respond, the text makes evident of that, but clearly others don't. And for reasons which the text actually doesn't explain, Paul comes to the end of his rope, and he does perhaps what Jesus himself had suggested, namely, shake the dust off your feet. It's in Jesus' words that that phrase appears four times in the Gospels, and it is an amazing 
phrase. It's an amazing idea. You come to the end of your responsibility. You release it and you let go. Now, what's interesting in this case is that, that Paul seems to use language that's a little more invective than that, like blood is on your heads if you don't follow what I'm saying. Clearly, Paul, uh, a vehement personality to say the least, the strongest personality, I would argue, in the whole New Testament, certainly a person who, like all of us, is still a fallen and redeemed sinner, uh, not, uh, not a perfected one, is full of himself. But he's also full of a strategy that acknowledges that there is a certain limitation to how far we can go. It's easy, I think, to sometimes reduce this to a moment where either you think Paul was the great hero who declared the truth and put the flag in the ground, or to make Paul the chief enemy of, of, of Jews, who then decided that he was prejudiciously going to simply abandon them and move on. What's very understated in the text is that immediately after this declaration, the, the text appears, Paul leaves and he goes immediately next door to the synagogue. <laughs> And, then, and he houses with people who are that include both Jews and Gentiles, and both Jews and Gentiles right next door to that synagogue continue to come to the faith. He's not abandoning a ministry to Jews, but he is making this interesting, strong statement about the fact that his ministry is at a, at a place of closing in its responsibility or focus in relationship to Jews. It's a very, very important turning point in Paul's ministry. I want us to just think for a couple of minutes more about what this really might encourage us to consider. First of all, there's this amazing cosmological vision that we hear in Acts 17, and then there's Acts 18. This is the reality that friends all of us live in, the reality between the big picture and the particular detail. It's about what we can say about, in a way, that phrase, I love humanity, it's people I can't stand. And it's that same sort of tension, I think, in a certain way in this text, where Paul's saying in Acts 17, this is the God who rules over all and holds all. Then he comes to Acts 18, and he comes to the limit of his humanity. In the limit of his humanity, perhaps he blurs the line between the limits of his humanity and the limits of God's compassion and mercy. Clearly, God has not in any way given up on Israel. God is not the one who shakes the dust off his feet. God is not the one who somehow uh, simply surrenders. No, it's, it's Paul, the Apostle Paul, in his own personal life and ministry. And he simply hands it back over to God. This is, this is beyond me. Now, friends, I want to suggest that there's nobody on this call that hasn't done this exact same thing. Not just once or twice, but probably many, many times in our lives. It's why we have certain friends and don't have certain other friends. It's why we see some people and we don't see other people. It's why we are prone to a line as the church in America seems so prone to do right now between the gathering of my favorite tribe versus the, the part of the tribe that I really don't want to be identified with. Wherever we stand on that array, this binary reality tends to continue to permeate our humanity. It's interesting to me that like so many other places in the Hebrew scriptures and in the New Testament, there's this amazing sense that God holds all of this and exposes all of this. We are left as interpreters to try to understand what do we make of this? Well, at the very least, it's, it's not just the difference between theory and practice, which is one way of understanding this, or between the many and the one. It's actually also a, a more subtle challenge to you and me to ask ourselves, what do we make about those places and circumstances where it feels to us that we are beating our head against the wall? Do we continue to simply beat our head against the wall, which was in some sense the, the, the experience perhaps that Paul was having in Corinth? Or do we make some kind of tactical change? It's really difficult to theologize about this because we still want to be in, as encompassing as Paul is in Acts 17, but we want to be as, as finite as Paul in Acts 18 suggests he is. And in, in the end, we are. We are called to ministry, brothers and sisters, in this really complicated time. It's going to be an ongoing battle to negotiate Acts 18 in all of our lives and in all of our ministries. It's easy to give ourselves to the big picture. 
and then actually surrender the particular detail. The people that we don't like, the people in our church, the people that are our colleagues, the people that are our neighbors, the, people's, the people that we just don't like or don't like us, or the people that we consider even enemies. What do we make of the, of the broad picture and the particular detail? Every single one of us every day is negotiating Acts 18, 1 to 11. In some way or another, we are engaged in this really challenging tension. I think what's hopeful is that by the end of this chapter, or the verses that are read rather, what we see is that God is going to be God anyway. Paul reaches his limit. He's right or he's wrong. He's partially right or partially wrong. He's, he's prejudiced or he's not prejudiced. The text doesn't really actually settle all that out for us. It just says this is where Paul came to. But the grace of God is going to continue on. And it actually turns out to meet whomever God chooses to meet. And what we want to try to yield ourselves to is a relentless connection to the God of relentless love. I'd invite you to maybe hold in your mind's eye as we close an image, not of a person that you easily love or that you agree with, but to close our eyes and think for a moment about people that we have a harder time loving, of people that seem, quote, stiff-necked, as the Hebrew scripture uses, of people that we find resistant to us or to the word of the gospel. How do we hold the one and the many? How do we hold the universal and the particular? How do we hold the places of easy love in the places of really challenging, difficult ministry? But God, as we envision those people, groups of people in this case is as in Acts 18. Groups of people that we may identify as stiff-necked, people who are unresponsive, people that seem to be so resistant to what we understand and believe to be the truth. We are called to become people whose love, whose ministry looks like your grace. Oh Lord, this is beyond us. It was beyond Paul at times, certainly is beyond us. May we, oh God, in your mercy, become people who love like you love, who see like you see, who both persist and release. Help us, oh God, to do so with humility, with wisdom, with compassion, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.
God. I hesitate to speak up when I know I should. It's hard to do what I know you ask of me. I'm kind of worried about what people think about me. What if I say the wrong things? What if I don't say enough? What if my words hurt the people that I love? No temas, si no habla y no calles. Yo estoy contigo. Nadie te va a atacar ni herir. I don't know how not to be afraid. It seems like there's no room for grace in this world. I struggle to love the people that you call me to serve. They're difficult. They don't listen when I speak about you. So why should I waste my words and my time? I don't get how you did this, Jesus. How did you love the very people you knew would betray you, crucify you? I don't think I can do it. I, I, don't, I don't want to do it. Not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent for I am with you and no one is going to attack and harm you. Lord, okay, how can you tell me that no one is going to harm me? You don't see the scars on my back? Do you see the color of my skin? Violence is everywhere and the more I try to convince people that you're God, that you're the judge and the ruler of this world, that you're a compassionate king that actually cares for the most vulnerable, the more I put myself in danger. These people are my enemies, so I can't love them like you, not unless they change or unless I do. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you. Chukezo tasurine, Nesame. Okay. Chunim up here. Cheo asunikan. Hanani mabu se. Se bar toru to watch sail. Chon te himu to sail. Because, Lord, if you, if you give me the strength, then I can actually speak. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you. I tremble in fear, God. I am so afraid of what you're calling me into. But you say you are with me. You are with me. You are with me. So I'm going to trust you and rely on you for every word, every breath, and every step. Amen. I am with you always. I am with you always. I am with you always.
putting the skin together, we fall down. We fall down, but we get up. We fall down, but we get up. We fall down, but we get up. For a saint is just a sin. God's final word of encouragement to Paul in this text, <clears throat> which we've just focused on and which is so profound, is a word of, of hope, a hope that's given to finite people, fallen people, to people who see and fear and see and don't fear, see and believe and see and doubt. It's a grace that is with us and for us. It's sobering that in this text, sometimes these words of the Apostle Paul are used to say that God has abandoned the Jews and it becomes the grounds of extraordinary global anti Semitism. And at the same time, it becomes the, the door that Paul walks through in order to manifest the graciousness and goodness of God to both Gentile and to Jewish people. Friends, ministry is complicated. You and I are complicated. This is a hard work. It just turns out that God is with us in our finitude. And when we fall down, he gets us back up. Receive this blessing. Now to God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, beyond all that we could ask or even imagine according to the power that is at work within us, to God be glory in the church, in the ministry of God's people here and everywhere both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. As we do at the end of every service, let's blow out the candle together. Following um, the service, we do have coffee and conversation with Mark Laberton, so stick around. Um, and to transition us from the service um, to our time of coffee and conversation, we just have one more song for you. Um, it's called Purge Me. It was written by Urban Doxology. So receive this gift as you go.
Desperate for 